Hey Lance Egan here with fly fishing skill builder number six. Today's technique is dry fly fishing. We're going to cover rods, lines, and leader and tippet materials. Before we get started though, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of these weekly skill builders. Dude, that's a big brown Rods, what do I need for dry fly fishing? Man, there are all kinds of them out there. From every price point, every company, there's all kinds of options. When I think about dry fly rods, number one, I think of action. If I'm buying a rod specifically for dry fly fishing, I usually want a more moderate action. Although you can do dry fly fishing with your nine foot five weight, you know, standard medium fast, fast action rod, there are lots of rods from just about every manufacturer that are tailored to the technique of dry fly fishing. By that I mean they've tailored the action and the tippet protection and things like that to this specific technique. So some of these that I've picked out for you, uh, I've kind of got four weights mostly across the board here. I've got a Winston Air 2, an Orvis Helios in their F series rather than the D, the Loomis NRX Plus LP light presentation, the Trout LL from Sage, a Winston Pure, uh, a Scott G series, and finally, uh, what I end up using a lot is a, a Euro rod. This one happens to be a Diamondback. It's a 10 foot two weight, but any Euro rod can work really well for small dry fly fishing. All of these share some characteristics in common. They're lighter weights. Um, I got fours, but most of these models come in, let's say six weights and lighter, uh, and all the way down to twos or threes in many cases. Uh, they're all more moderate action rods. so. Why do we need a moderate action rod for dry fly fishing? You don't necessarily need it, but we don't, when we're throwing a dry fly, it's a pretty small, not very wind resistant pattern. Even if you're throwing two dries together, you don't need a lot of power in the turnover of the, of the leader and the line and so on. So we can get away with a softer rod that generates less power and therefore sets down a bit on the softer side of things. The other advantage to having a slightly softer rod is tippet protection. So when we're fishing really fine tippets, things that are, you know, 4X is on the heavier end of most small dry flies, 5X, 6X, 7X tippets. If you get your nine foot six weight fast action rod or seven weight that you usually throw streamers with and you set 7X out there and you set up on a nice sized fish, you're likely to break that fish off. The rod doesn't give enough, it doesn't have enough bend in the tip to protect that tippet on that short, quick uh, pull when you're setting the hook. So think, uh, action wise when you're looking at dry fly rods think a little bit on the softer side medium fast maybe even down to slow action I chose mostly higher end rods they're some of my favorites but there are rod models that are of course more budget friendly uh, next up let's think length uh, when I think length in a dry fly rod I think of a couple things number one where am I going to fish am I fishing big water am I fishing a small creek if I'm fishing a small creek I can get away with a very small rod, a seven footer, seven and a half, eight, maybe even up to a nine foot rod, medium sized water, eight, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half foot rods. On, ten, uh, on uh, big water, I even fish some 10 footers sometimes. The advantage there is line control. You can mend, you can reposition, you can roll cast, much easier with a longer rod. So while you could fish big water with a seven and a half or eight foot dry fly rod, it's going to limit you somewhat. It'll be harder to cast distance, it'll be harder to mend and reposition line, and the shorter rod doesn't move, it's not as long of a lever, it doesn't move as much line. So if you throw a nice 40, 50 foot cast out there on a big river, and a fish comes up and takes your fly, that short rod is not moving as much line, you're not getting as tight to that fish. So think length, um, you know, consider that I guess when you're thinking about dry fly rods. Next up, the weight of the rod. So we're not talking physical weight, we're talking line weight here. Uh, one weight, two weight, three weight, four weight. To me, dry fly rods kind of end at a six. If you're throwing really large dries, big chubby Chernobyls, big hoppers, sometimes on a big western river with wind, a six weight might be the best option. More common would be fives or fours or even three weights for dry fly fishing, but there are situations where with big flies and in wind, a heavier rod is your friend. That said, most dry fly fishing I think is done with five weights and lighter. Uh, personally, I do most of my dry fly fishing with one, two, and three weight rods, occasionally a four or a five. For me, my four or five weights are more limited to boat fishing, fishing from the raft, fishing from a drift boat, versus wade fishing, I tend to fish four weights and lighter. 
Now that varies, of course, depending on the size of the water you're wading, but I'm speaking generally here. Again, with the weight of the rod, physical weight is something to consider. The weight of the line that the rod throws is something to consider. The lighter the, the rod is, the lighter the line that it needs to throw. A five weight rod uh, is designed to throw a 140 grain fly line. A uh, four weight rod throws 120 grain fly line. So as you step down in line weight in each rod, you have less mass of the line hitting the water less likelihood of the, of the fish being spooked from the impact of that line touching the water. So lighter is better as long as you can cast the size of fly. I wouldn't want to take a two or a three weight for a giant fly like a chubby Chernobyl, but it would throw a small mayfly, a caddis, even a small terrestrial really well. The other thing that the lighter rods do, of course, as we've talked about, is tippet protection. When you go to set the hook while you're fighting fish, you're trying to apply that last bit of pressure when you're ready to land a fish. Having a softer rod, which lighter rods are, generally speaking, softer action-wise, they'll, they'll protect that tippet for you. As far as brands go, I mentioned some of our favorites here, but there are, there are dry fly rods available from every fly fishing brand. So find one that works for you, find one in your favorite brand, and make that work. Last, I want to cover a couple other considerations before you buy a rod. So number one, think about your investment range. As I mentioned, these are all higher end rods. There are less expensive, there's middle price point rods, everything's available. Uh, so think about your investment range. How much are you going to use it? Are you going to use it a lot? Is it going to be your favorite rod? Is it going to be one that sits on the shelf, you know, six, eight months out of the year? You have to decide all those things and justify that purchase. Next, again, the physical weight. Where are you going to use it? How are you going to use it? What size flies are you targeting? Uh, what size fish are you targeting? Uh, another thing that's often overlooked is recovery speed. How fast does the rod go from flexed back to straight? You can have a very soft rod that's, that actually has very quick recovery speed that helps you cast and helps you with accuracy, sends less shock waves down the legs, uh, the bottom leg of your loop when you stop that rod. Instead of sending a bunch of bouncy waves down your loop, it levels out, it go, comes to a rest very quick and makes your cast much more accurate, gives you more control. So one thing you want to look for in all of the rods, high end, low end, whatever, is recovery speed, which is affected by several things, the fiber of the rod, and also the physical weight of the rod affects recovery speed, but something to think about. Last, where will you fish the rod? Is it going to be big water? Is it going to be small water, medium water? What size flies are you going to use? What size fish do you intend to catch? We don't want to take a two weight if all of the trout we're going to catch are 20 plus inches. We're going to have a hard time landing them. We don't want to take a six weight if all the flies we're going to fish are going to be tiny. So, you know, keep those things in mind and have fun dry fly fishing. It's my favorite way to fish. I spend as much time as I can every summer chasing fish with dries, and a lot of times on our tailwaters locally, we can even do it through the winter. Fly lines, fly lines to match our dry fly rod. In our shop, the most popular lines we sell are usually weight forward floating lines that are usually a little overweighted, half a line heavy, sometimes even a full line heavy, like the Mastery Infinity or the Scientific Angler's uh, Amplitude Infinity, the Rio Gold, lines like that. Uh, while they're a good all-around line, they're not necessarily the best option for dry fly specific fishing. So we're going to get rid of those for now, and what we're going to do is talk about dry fly specific lines. What makes a dry fly specific line? Number one, the taper design and the physical weight of the, of the fly line. So that by taper design, uh, double taper and, and weight forward is one taper design, but what I'm more referring to is the length of the front taper, the length of the belly, and so on. Think about this, when you have, when you add length to the front end of a fly line, on the taper end of it, uh, when you're talking going from thick to thin, the longer that front taper is, the longer and uh, it, it takes for it to turn over, so it delays turnover a bit, but more importantly, it reduces energy. The more compact, the shorter that taper is, the more energy it carries and turns over with more gusto. It wants to really turn something over hard. So when you buy a line like a Scientific Angler's MPX, a Rio Grand, something like that, that's designed to have pretty powerful delivery, it's because they're shortening, part one of the aspects of those lines is they're shortening that front taper. In dry fly specific lines, we want lines usually with those long front tapers that delay turnover and that also lose energy so that sets your fly down nice and soft. So those type of lines are available from every manufacturer. Uh, they come in different taper designs as far as double taper or weight forward. Both of those lines can work really, really well. Uh, one other thing these lines all share in common, generally speaking, is they're very true to weight. By that I mean 
If it's a five weight line, they weigh 140 grains in the first 30 feet. They're not overweighted, they're not designed to overload because they're really designed to fish more on a softer or medium action rod. So all of these lines I have here, we have the Orvis Pro Trout, the Airflow uh, Tactical, the Cortland 444 Peach, the old standby. From Rio, we have their Technical Trout Series in both double tapers and weight forwards. From Scientific Anglers, the, the Scientific Angler Amplitude Double Taper, and the Trout Standard or just their Trout Taper. My favorite lines for dry fly fishing are long belly weight forwards, like the Amplitude Trout or the Amplitude Double Taper, which isn't just a long belly because it, the belly extends from the entire, through the entire line. Uh, I like that long front taper. I like the delayed turnover. I like the soft presentation that all of these types of lines will provide you. You can get lines in, uh, in different price points. For instance, Scientific Anglers makes their Trout Taper in uh, two or three different price points. You know, 130, 100, 79, 59, and most of the other companies have those same types of options. So you don't have to be buying the most expensive if it's if you know you're working with a budget or you just don't use that rod very often. As far as weight forward versus double taper goes, I want to dispel one myth. One myth in fly fishing is that double taper lines are more delicate for dry fly fishing. That's 100% not true. There's not enough information in that statement to make it true. A double taper line simply means that it tapers on both ends instead of tapering just on one end. But you could have a weight forward and a double taper that the fishing end are identical and they fish identical. Until you got past like 40 or 50 feet into the line, they would fish exactly the same. So I end up using a double taper a lot on lighter rods, mostly because I'm cheap and I like having two fly lines built into one. I can use one end of the line and then when I wear that out, flip it around. I'm not making very long casts on small water most of the time where if I'm fishing from a drift boat or a raft where I'm making longer casts repeatedly, I tend to get where into the section of the line that's in the middle and I don't, I don't really have that option to necessarily flip it around. There are less double taper lines available. They're far less popular. For most people, they're a little tougher to cast, but they do offer some advantages. One is being able to flip the line around. Another is mending and, and roll casting because they keep mass further back in the line. That said, you can get longer bellied weight forwards like the trout taper from Scientific Anglers. These technical trouts have pretty good long uh, tapers to them as well. All of those allow you to roll cast and mend and reposition line very well. If you have a very short, compact dry fly line or any fly line, when you go to reposition line, if you're out of that belly of line and you're into just the running line, the thin running line on a weight forward line, it's not going to pick up and mend and reposition very well for you. All right. Next up, textured versus smooth. Some of these companies like Orvis, like Scientific Anglers, like Airflow have different texture options in their fly lines. Most of them also offer some smooth finish products. Rio and, and Cortland at this time, they're just making smooth finish products. Uh, both of them are very, very good. Both are very fishy. For my preference, I really like the textured lines from Scientific Anglers. I think they shoot the best. To me, they float the highest and reposition the easiest, but they also tend to be the most expensive something to consider when you're buying one. Uh, color of line. I don't think you're gonna find that the color of a fly line makes a difference to the fish. We have people that are worried, especially when they're dry fly fishing, about the color of the line scaring the fish. My opinion is that the fly line doesn't make any difference at all. I've taken fly lines to New Zealand that are bright colored that everybody told you you couldn't do. I've taken them to spring creeks. And if you land that fly line well upstream of a fish and let it drift over the top of even a feeding trout, they couldn't care any less. What does bother a trout is the impact of the line hitting the water. If it hits anywhere near them, it doesn't matter whether the line's pink, orange, camouflage, clear, it doesn't matter. The impact of the line is what's scaring those fish. That said, you can get a lot of lines in various colors. Some people love a brighter line, they can see it easier. Some people are more confident with a more drab colored line. To me, the line color doesn't make any difference. I'm more focused on the taper design that I like and maybe the finish of the line, how well it floats, etc. cetera. Uh, how do these relate to the rods we were talking about just a second ago? When we talk about dry fly rods, we're talking softer, more medium action products. These lines are designed to complement those type of rods. They're not overloaded, they're softer. Again, we're looking for delicate type presentations. These are all true to weight. They're all very, very light. They're going to float well. They're going to, to suit the needs of that softer dry fly rod. So although you, again, can use a more traditional fly line that's a little overweighted for dry fly fishing, if you really want to dial in your dry fly game, 
go a little lighter, go true to weight, think a more uh, or less aggressive turnover type of line. All right, brands, price points, I'm, I covered already. There's lots of price, price points across the board from all the different brands. You don't have to pick one. Uh, hopefully that information will help you navigate your next line purchase when you wanna team up a dry fly line with your new dry fly rod. All right, let's talk leaders and tippets and maybe a little bit about floatant regarding dry fly fishing. All right, first of all, let's cover leaders. When you're fishing dries, you want to have, generally speaking, as long of a leader as you can stand and still cast and have some relative accuracy. Uh, in my opinion, one of the most common mistakes of dry fly fishing is people use much too short of leaders. I know I did for a long time. The longer the leader, the less power you have in the delivery of the fly, but that's a good thing in most cases. To get a good, nice drag-free drift, most of the time you really don't want the leader to turn over and land straight, because as soon as it does, it gets dragged. You want it to have some slack to build some hooks or some piling of the tippet to allow a nice drag-free drift. So with that in mind, I'm going to recommend that you go longer than you usually use. Uh, most people, when they come to the shop, buy seven and a half to nine foot leaders. For dry fly specific type of, of application, I would say go 10 feet and longer. And really, I never fish 10 footers. For me, it's 12 foot to maybe 20 feet of, of leader and tippet. You can buy these dry fly leaders from every company. We have them from Umpqua, from Fulling Mill, from Trout Hunter, Scientific Anglers, Rio, everybody makes them. Uh, they come in, in different lengths, they come in different diameters. Uh, they're all very, very similar. They all stretch very well, so you can release the memory. I really don't have a favorite brand of leader, but what I would just suggest is that you go longer than you normally would. So if you're used to a nine or a 10 footer, try a 12 or 14 footer. Uh, some of the companies, Scientific Angler Leaders here, we have an 11, a 12, and a 14. Uh, from Fully Mill, there's a 12 footer. From Trout Hunter, we have them an eight, 10, and 14. Umqua, we have seven and a half, nine, and we have 13 footers. Rio makes a 12 and a 15 footer. Again, in longer, they all make seven and a half and nine foot leaders as well. But in the longer leaders, those are some of our favorite options. I would suggest that you use leaders for dry fly fishing that are nylon, not fluorocarbon. That said, in the tippet, fluorocarbon's totally all fine, and I'll, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But in the leader specifically, just get nylon leaders. They stretch easier, they straighten easier, they're less dense, they won't push through the water column, and they'll allow your fly to stay floating quite a bit longer. Uh, outside of that, think what you're going to fish. Are you going to fish really small water? Are you going to fish really small flies, really big flies? You know, if you needed to be really, really sneaky and have really light presentation, really delicate presentations, the longest, lightest leaders are going to be your friend. Uh, also think the relation to butt diameter to tippet. The thinner the tippet is, generally speaking, the butt diameter will also be a little thinner. So a 6X tapered leader doesn't share the same butt diameter as a 2 or 3X tapered leader. Some of them will, like 5 or 6X might have the same butt diameter, but if you're changing quite a bit, you know, you go from a 2X 7.5 foot leader to a 10, 12 foot 6X, the butt diameter is also thinner on that 6X because it doesn't need as much power to turn over. So keep that in mind. Also keep in mind the diameter of the tapered end, the thinner end of the leader. Most commercial leaders follow kind of a 60% uh, butt section, 20% taper, 20% tippet rule. So when you're buying a longer leader, you're not really buying that much more tippet, you're mostly buying more butt section. That still turns over, but the butt of the leader is still lighter than your fly line and still reduces that energy transfer, so it helps to be more delicate. Leader-wise, if you're fishing a really large fly, let's say you're throwing something like a big chubby Chernobyl, a big hopper, and you're wanting to pound banks all day, a 14-foot leader is probably not the best option. That might be tough to turn over with a big fly. Now we're back to our 9-footers, maybe a 10-footer, maybe even a 7.5-footer, depending on your casting ability. And then you might even consider something like a power taper. This is designed to have a thicker butt section and, and have more uh, powerful delivery for a big fly. On the flip side of things, if we're throwing tiny little Griffiths gnats or CDC blooming olives or PMDs or something that's very delicate, then we're gonna get into those 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, or even longer tapered leaders, soft, delicate presentations. Those really long leaders are really hard to throw big stuff with, uh, big flies with, but they're perfect for tiny, tiny dries. All right, we talked a bit about leaders. Let's move into tippet. 
One myth in fly fishing is you can't use fluorocarbon tibet for dry flies. And again, I wouldn't suggest using a fluorocarbon leader, but just the tibet section is fine in fluorocarbon. In fact, most really, uh, you know, most people online that I see that, that discount the ability to use fluorocarbon on dry fly leaders, uh, they'll tell you the first thing they'll say is you have to use nylon for dry fly fishing. And then the next thing I tell you is the best way to fish is to degrease the nylon so that it sinks below the surface tension and casts less of a shadow. Fluorocarbon does that for you. It's a teeny tiny bit more dense than nylon. Not dramatically, just a little bit. Personally, because I don't want to carry nylon and fluorocarbon tippets, in my vest, I only carry fluorocarbon tippet. That way, when I'm fishing 4X, 5X, 6X tippets, there's no problem using those for drives, NIM streamers, any of, the, any of the above. So I only carry fluorocarbon. That said, you can certainly fish dry flies with nylon tippet as well. All right, so every brand makes all of these, same in the leaders, same in the tippet. You can buy nylon, you can buy fluoro. Another thing to consider is you can build your own custom leaders. Uh, for my really fine, delicate dry fly fishing, that's what I do. I use mostly Maxima Chameleon, and I build what I would call Spanish-style leaders. Um, we have some of those available on, on some of our previous tutorials. There's been some even some recipes listed, or you could just Google Spanish-style dry fly leader, and you'll come up with a bunch of recipes uh, in a more domestic level, uh, George Harvey leader is a very, very common dry fly style leader. You can look up the, the recipe for that and build your own dry fly leaders with that formula also. In tippets, the other thing to consider is suppleness. So the thinner the leader is, obviously, uh, the less likely the fish are to see it. However, I don't think that the fish are really concerned about that. To me, the fish are concerned about the drift of your fly. So if you're going to 6 and 7x tippets and you're fishing fluoro over nylon, to me the reason to do that is for the suppleness of that tippet. Think two things. One, drag-free drift. When you tie a tiny fly on a very fine, delicate tippet, it just allows the fly to look more natural. Less of a worry when you're throwing a big, tiny, a big uh, dry fly like a chubby or a hopper. In that case, 2x, 3x, 4x is fine. But when we're fishing tiny little delicate CDC patterns, tiny parachutes, little Griffiths gnats, in that case, a fine tippet is your friend. It's going to allow that fly to look more natural and also a thinner, more supple tippet will allow the fish to get the fly in their mouth much easier. So don't, don't be tempted to rope up too much on your dry fly tippets. Most of the time, 5X and thinner for small dries, you can get bigger than 5X when you start talking about larger dries. Again, hoppers, terrestrials, uh, cicadas, big salmon flies, anything that's going to be, let's say, size 12 or larger, you could rope up a bit more on your tippet. Again, fluorocarbon and nylon, you can use both. They'll, they'll work great in the tippet only. Don't buy fluorocarbon leaders for dry fly fishing, just nylon. Um, what else? Matching diameters. If you're buying, you know, this case, a 15-foot 4X leader, you wouldn't want to add 3X tippet to it. This tapers to 4X diameter. You're going to add 4X, 5X, or 6X tippet to a leader like that continue with the taper and also not have something that tapers down to thin and then add something thick back to the fishing end of it. That doesn't make sense. So make sure you're matching diameters there. That's why we have the X scale. I think we've covered enough about leader and tippet. Again, go longer than you think. Go longer on your tippet. The more tippet you add to that rig, the more slack the leader will build in itself. All right, moving into fly floatants. In this case, you don't need all of these floatants in your pack. Obviously, that would be cumbersome. But I do want to talk about some of the differences in the, diff in the various floatants. Uh, number one thing to consider, are you fishing CDC flies? For those of you that don't know, CDC is a type of feather that comes from a duck. Uh, CDC stands for col de canard, a bud of duck, I believe, in French is what I'm told anyway. I don't speak French. What it is is basically feathers that surround the gland on a duck that secretes the oil that makes their feathers waterproof. And CDC feathers are very light, they're very fluffy, they're very delicate. And the little fibers, the little tiny filaments that come off of each of the stems of the feathers are what help naturally float a CDC fly. So those little tiny barbules, um, when they're extended, they kind of capture in the water surface. But if you put the wrong floating on them and mat them down, they tend to be waterlogged and they don't float at all. So with that in mind, if you're fishing CDC patterns, you need to fish CDC friendly floatants like hen CDC oil, like Loon Loxa, like Tiemco Dry Magic, CNF Design Power Float, or dry and or, I like to use both, or powder style floatants, Shimazaki Dry Shake, Loon Top Ride, Frog's Fanny, 
any of those work really, really well on CDC flies. These, pa these uh, floatants, with the exception maybe of the CDC oil, the rest of these floatants also work on every other dry fly. So if you wanted to just make it easy, just buy some Tiemco Dry Magic, buy some Loon Loxa, and use it on all of your dry flies. That's, that's simple. Uh, other considerations, there's fly dips in floatants. So there's the Loon Fly Dip, there's Fly Agra, there's a Shimazaki Fly Dip. Those are products where you actually dip your fly in them and then pull it out, let it kind of air dry. It's kind of creating a waterproof coating over the top of the fly. For me, they work best on medium to larger size flies. I haven't had as good a success on those with really tiny flies, but they do, they do still help a little bit. And then you have kind of the old standbys, paste floatants like Gink, like a Quell. Uh, there are numerous other brands. A little thicker formulation than these, so they don't work on CDC, but they will work on any fly that doesn't have CDC. One quick tip on floatants that I think most people overlook when they're fishing dry flies is using a product like Payette Paste or Muselin. Payette Paste is my favorite. It's a thick floatant. Um, you can see it's not runny at all. It's very, very thick, so it just stays on your, your whatever you put it on better than say gink or a quell. What I use it for most is putting it on the last couple feet of my fly line where the taper of the fly line, uh, the micro balloons that are in the fly line aren't as numerous so it doesn't float as well. I don't coat the whole fly line in it, literally just the very tip of it. Uh, I'll put it on and I'll run it down my leader all the way to the tippet. One quick tip is to use a really thick float like that on your leader. It will help you lift the fly off without pulling the fly under the water. It will help you reposition and mend and lift line off the water easier. Your, your, when you go to recast, it won't make a big pop because it's not pulling your fly through the water. Uh, it'll just lift off a lot easier. So every time you go dry fly fishing, you should coat your leader with a bit of payette paste all the way down, not the very last tippet because you don't want that to be floating. So you might leave two or three feet at the end of the leader or the tippet section that doesn't have it, but all the butt section, cover it in payette paste and then reapply it every hour or so to keep that leader floating nice and high. Otherwise, Again, same thing applies here. Think about which flies you're using and use the best floatant for the best fly uh, presentation. Again, CDC, CDC friendly floatants, big flies, gink, aquel, the dips, all those will work. And last but not least, I like to use them in conjunction, the paste style floatant as well as a powder style floatant. So you put the paste on your dry fly when it's brand new out of the box, it's not wet, it's totally dry. You put paste on there, it'll help it float. You fish it for an hour or two, or better yet, you've hooked a fish or two and it's no longer floating. Adding more of this won't do you a lot of good. First thing you want to do is dry it out. Dry it out in your hand, or sorry, not in your hand, in your shirt. Dry it on a little cloth that you maybe keep in your vest. And once it's dry, or maybe use the little banjo, the little rubber band trick that we've taught you before to dry a CDC fly or a standard fly. And after it's dried out, then stick it in the dry shake or the top ride and the powder style floatants like Frog's Fanny, any of those, you can brush it in them, you can stick it in and shake it and kind of revive that fly, get it floating high again, get it setting high on the water so the fish can grab hold of it and they like those dries usually sitting pretty high, especially caddis patterns. Uh, keep them nice and dry, those, those powder style floatants are crucial for that type of application. Otherwise, have fun out there, get out there, try and find some dry fly eating fish it's, the fav it's our favorite way to catch fish, and I think we've given you some tips with rods, with lines, with leaders, tippet, and floatants that will make your next dry fly experience a better one.